I'm Jennifer Riley Chetwin. I'm the co-director of the One World, One Water Center at Metropolitan State University of Denver. And this is our latest installment of Tom Talks. The OWOW Center is an interdisciplinary water studies program. And we have the good fortune of digging into water stories on this Tom Talks video series, both near and far. Today, we have the pleasure of traveling all the way to Egypt. We are going to be talking about the Nile River. It doesn't get any more back to the origin of water management than talking about the Nile, where irrigation was created and agriculture, you might argue, was also created. So we have a wonderful lineup today. We have three guests who are going to speak with us about the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam on the Blue Nile, which is the major tributary to the Nile River. This is a $5 billion project that will, when it's completed, be an area of roughly the size of London behind this dam. It is the largest hydroelectric plant and project ever in Africa. It started in 2011, and just this July, they started filling it with water, even though it's not 100% completed yet. This has a lot of potential benefit, but as is always the case, some potential challenges as well. It will provide electricity for Ethiopia and downstream neighbors, Egypt and Sudan, but there are some controversies. While Sudan is generally in favor, it will bring cheap electricity and more predictable water flows. Ethiopia has some mixed, mixed thoughts, although um, most, more than half of Ethiopians do not have electricity. So it stands to significantly benefit and raise the standard of living in Ethiopia. In Egypt, it's perhaps more of a mixed story. 90% uh, of Egypt's water comes from the Nile. So needless to say, this leaves some people with uncertainty and doubts about the impact this dam will have. So let me introduce our guests. Dr. Nehal Abdelrahman from MIU Egypt University is a communications professor. Thank you for joining us. We have Forrest Wilson, an MSU Denver graduate and journalist pursuing a master's degree in Middle Eastern Studies at the American University of Beirut. Thanks for having me, Jordan. And we have a little closer to home, Dr. Sean Schaefer, MSU Denver's Associate Vice President for Curriculum and a journalism professor who has taught in Egypt. So let's jump in, starting with you, Sean. As a Coloradan, you are very familiar with the controversy that goes along with dams. Having spent time in Egypt, how would you compare the situation there and the reaction to the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam? Well, I think they're very similar because we run into the same problem in both cases, is we're really talking about how we're gonna use the finite resource of water for some very disparate needs and desires. Um, as you noted in Ethiopia, one of the things they're really looking at is hydroelectric generation. Um, here, when we talk about damming, we're often talking about who's going to get to be the end user. Um, you know, we still have a continuing fight here over agricultural use and city use. Well, it's the same everywhere is who's going to use it and how they're going to use it. And all we know for sure is, you know, once you dam that river, you've, you've changed it forever. And so the, the story very much changes. So I'm, uh, it's great to have been in both locations, but I don't see the problems as, as significantly different between the two. Yeah, there are, there are certainly some universal traits to water. So um, that, that's an interesting perspective, having spent time in both places. Uh, Nihal, over to you. As an Egyptian, can you paint a picture of the cross-border stresses that already exist in the region over water? And maybe discuss a little bit about how this dam stands to improve or exacerbate these problems. Okay, of course, there are a lot of tensions in the area, not only because of water, but water is a main issue here when we are talking about the Renaissance Dam. Uh, I'm a bit skeptical about uh, the idea that Sudan is completely in favor because Sudan has its fears from uh, the floods that could result from uh, any problems with this dam. Uh, Egypt has its concerns as well, but Egypt's main uh, idea is not the dam itself, is how um, fast we're going to fill this um, dam, or Ethiopia is going to fill this dam. Um, the Nile is shared by 11 countries around, um, around it. It's what we call the Nile Basin. 
And uh, that's why uh, there are a lot of conventions and international agreements that were um, uh, agreed upon um, much, much earlier in history. So, uh, of course, I see that Ethiopia has a lot of problems with electricity and they need it. But other countries around it are uh, surprised by, uh, or the question is brought in suddenly, what are we going to do if this changes? If the amount of water per person uh, changes? Uh, of course, um, there are other tensions around in Libya, in, um, in, uh, on the other side in Greece, um, uh, in Syria. Um, most of them are uh, what is said that it's around uh, uh, petrol and around gas, but it's not only this, it's around water as well. You know that the river in Litani is shared by uh, Israel and Palestine. Uh, El Asi is uh, shared by Syria and Turkey. So the Nile River is not the only uh, water um, source shared by many countries. Actually, if you go to statistics, you will find that a lot of countries uh, have their water resources either outside uh, their countries like India and Pakistan or shared by many in back to Egypt. Egypt has done some alternatives, uh, finding wells, um, uh, not uh, cultivating rice anymore as it needs a lot of uh, water and finding other things to cultivate and finding alternative uh, solutions. In the OWOW program, program, the One World, One Water Center program, it's interdisciplinary for that very reason. Water is really a fill in the blank issue. In this case, we're looking at the electricity generating benefits of, of a dam, but it's an environmental issue. It is a political issue. It is socioeconomic. It is religious. It, it, water carries so many implicit and explicit uh, values that that definitely That's why we say uh, what is the secret of life <laughs> it is it is it definitely is um so to you Forrest uh you've also produced a short documentary film that touches on water challenges for a community living on an island in the Nile tell us a little bit about that experience and how it shaped your views on water in the region yeah, so it was a documentary film I made along with four Egyptian students when I was studying in Egypt. Um, and the documentary was on the Nubian people who live on the Nile Islands. Um, and those Nubian peoples um, were forced out of their homeland by the building of the Aswan High Dam and the flooding of Lake Nasser. They were relocated. So now um, a portion of them, I guess, live on these uh, islands in the Nile. And the specific islands that we did the documentary on, they have a total lack of infrastructure. They cannot source clean water, even though the Nile surrounds them. Um, and I think it's a good historical precedent for what is gonna happen with the Grand Renaissance High Dam. Um, if, if, you, if you look at it, I, I think that Egypt, when it built the Aswan High Dam, it, um, it didn't take the proper, the proper measures before building the dam, for the Nubians especially. Um, it didn't put these infrastructures in place. It didn't make these assurances. It, instead, it waited until many years after, and even 60 years now after the building of the Aswan High Dam, these Nubians still don't have access to clean drinking water. So I think what, what the takeaway there is that Egypt has to make some concessions and find some concrete ways that they're going to deal with the filling of the dam. And I think they have some flexibility. There is a reservoir in the Aswan High Dam that they can use for a little bit. Um, but I think that they really need to come to the table with the Ethiopians and make some concessions, hammer things out before it's filled. I guess it's already being filled, so they need to get things done quickly. Otherwise, it's going to be filled. And if drought comes, uh, people are going to suffer.